In today's episode, Dad treats me like the least important person in the office, so I only let him know about something critical once instead of hounding him to get it done. Mileage versus hourly wage. Do you know who I am? So let's get started. Dad treats me like the least important person in the office, so I only let him know about something critical once instead of hounding him to get it done. My dad is a CPA. A total boomer. An awful boomer. He was exempted from serving in Vietnam for medical reasons, rare bone disease, and has zero sympathy for Vietnam vets who haven't gotten their SH asterisk T together already. He thinks mental illnesses, including PTSD, are made up ways for doctors to give you drugs, and anyone who succumbs is weak. For example, I have bipolar, and anyone who knows anything about it knows that I should take my meds as prescribed for the rest of my life. To him, that means I chose drugs, am no better than a heroin addict, and deserve no respect. His office and mind are absolutely chaotic. Things are lost, shuffled under stuff. Where's that file, was one of the most common questions asked by any staff. Dad would have the whole office stop to look for an important file for a co-worker who swears she gave it to him, but he has no recollection of that happening. Guess where I find the file? On his desk, over by his adding machine, under a mountain of church charity brochures he just ordered. His email. Wow. If I told you he, at any given time, had over 3,000 unread emails, would that surprise you? Most of them were spam or 100 days of prayer stuff, but there were important emails going unchecked. Especially anything I sent him, because nothing about me was important enough to even warrant a glance. The worst part of him making me feel useless was the fact that I was the only one who would notice something like we're running out of stationery and try to order some, only to be told to wait and have to bring it up multiple times until we're down to our last two pieces and the cheapskate is photocopying our stationery because no one will notice or care. From office supplies, to maintaining our ability to e-file, to arranging everyone's continuing education for the year, always done December 28th to 30th in a panic, calling vendors to keep our equipment running, cranking out tax returns he should have done already while the clients wait in the lobby to pick it up, I was never fast enough, to consoling or counseling co-workers on how to approach him regarding X, new software installation, yes there are people in their 20s to 40s who don't know how to install a disk or open a file and click run. I was running myself ragged for the good of his company, but anything I had to say was immediately disregarded. Sorry about the previous run-on sentence. Don't know how to structure it better and still give an idea of how broad my responsibilities were because no one else gave a damn. One thing he was a stickler about, saving copies of asterisk everything. For example, in 2009 the IRS demanded a copy of a customer's certain payroll tax form they claimed not to have received from 1996. We hadn't even prepared the damn thing, but we had a copy. The paper got to be too much and the filing cabinets in the attic were creating cracks in the ceiling. We went paperless and our extremely competent IT guy set us up three backup systems. Since we by then had two offices, he had two one terabyte hard drives that every two seconds, exchanged data so if a tornado blew away a whole building, we'd still have everything from both buildings and the other building. Another backup was kept in the cloud, and another on a server in a state across the country. One day, I had been yelled at once again until I started to cry, then was berated because of all the drugs I'm doing because he certainly didn't do anything to make me that emotional. Either go home and cry or shut up and do your job. And if he had to remind me of something, it was because I was on drugs and not because he gave me 27 things to do standing in my office while I was clearly eating on my lunch break. On January 5th one year, I got an email from our IT guy, who had CC'd dead but knew to include me, that our one terabyte backups had enough space to last maybe two days, and that he could upgrade us in time to prevent disaster. I called over to dad, our offices were adjacent, and our voices carry, that IT guy sent a really important email. Dad replies a high in a way that tells me he's not paying a bit of attention to what I was saying. 
so I forwarded my email to him and changed the subject to urgent important pending disaster and gave him no further reminders after that. Not my job. I was supposed to shut up, remember? So he didn't read either email. Even with my subject line, my email didn't strike him as one he should read. On January 8th, the SH asterisk T hit the fan. We lost everything. Our IT guy dropped everything and got everything up to December 27th from the cloud backup. The server in the other state said it would cost a $7,000 rush fee and three weeks to fully restore everything the way it was. Well, W2S and numerous payroll reports, sales tax filings, and other government deadlines occur in January. So we didn't have three weeks. My co-workers had to redo or reconstruct everything they'd done from December 27th to January 8th, which was a lot. Anything we had completed, scanned, and shredded was gone. A major audit was underway, and several crucial spreadsheets had disappeared. The worker that had prepared them did so on his last two days before moving to another firm, December 26th and 27. All in all, our IT guy was paid about $12,000 to spend three 14 to 16 hour days, one was his Sabbath, rescuing what he could. Over $10,000 in overtime pay. And we still had missing stuff. This was concerning to clients affected because to them data loss equals data breach. Nobody would ever hack into our system because our IT guy would consider it a personal failure if we were successfully hacked. Our data was safe from everyone but dad. Dad never suspected me of anything. Had I pointed out that I had reminded him only once, since he thought I should only have to be told something once, he would have berated me for sabotaging the firm. While he wouldn't listen to me, it was my job to make sure he did his job. Don't think so. End of malicious compliance. Eventually the harassment became too much, and I had a nervous breakdown and quit. I do food delivery for a living because something in me is broken, and I don't think I could hold down a real job anymore. My mental health has vastly improved since I left that place, and I maintain my credential, and offer free random tax advice on Reddit to stay sharp. And before all the comments start about what a shitshow of a CPA office this must be, they are all like that. The co-worker who quit in deck came back to us the next year, and said that even with $10,000 CRM software supposedly tracking workflow at the third largest firm in our state, where's the so and so file, was the number one question on a daily basis, and they spent as much time looking for stuff as they did doing actual work. Every worker we've had with previous experience working for another CPA agreed, files got lost all. The. Time. Mileage versus hourly wage. This happened a few years ago. I'm changing some details to protect people I still actually really like. The MC in question wasn't mean spirited, so I don't intend to burn anyone. My job has me drive a lot lots of highway driving as I visit different sites and so on. We have some vehicles for just such a purpose, but they're in short supply and high demand, and I always felt like if I was using a van for just me, I was depriving someone else of doing something with four or five other people, much more efficient, you see, so I didn't feel bad if I took my own vehicle and claimed the mileage afterwards. When my boss went on a sabbatical, the operations guy was my temporary boss. In a meeting, he showed me the numbers on my mileage claims and how they were higher than before. I pointed out that the other vehicles were being used a lot, so I just took my own car. This was too much money to be paying out when we own vehicles, he said, and told me that he was making an exception to our staff policy about mileage by requiring me to only use a company vehicle for all work appointments. I clarified did he mean all? Yes, he said, all. Sure. I can do that. I went through and I booked a vehicle for the following six months for every appointment I knew I would have, scheduled meetings. Then I created a spreadsheet wherein I tracked the mileage I would have claimed, then compared it to a combination of the cost of the company vehicle, plus my hourly rate and my salary if the vehicle was even slightly inconvenient to get. Some explanation here, I live in the south end of my city. My office is right downtown. 
Some of our locations are south of the city, and some are north of the city. So, for the southern visits, I would leave from my house and go to the location directly. Well, now I was driving to the office, getting a vehicle, driving back past my house to go to the southern locations, then repeating the same in reverse. I tracked all the time I spent in traffic doing this. Oh, and then a sudden meeting arose in the city, but I couldn't get one of the normal cars to use. All that was left was one of our 15 passenger vans. Ah, but I can't drive one of those vans as I don't have the right kind of license. So, I had to take one of the seats out to bring it below the threshold of what's legal. And I drove all alone in a 15 passenger van, now an 11, to a meeting 12 minutes away. And back. Then replace the seat. It was such a pain. So inconvenient. So very, very costly, if you considered how much time I was wasting that wasn't being used for actual work things. After a few months of this, I took it to my, now returned, boss and let him know what I'd done, in compliance with the directive of operations guy. According to my math, the company had paid nearly $1,000 more in my salary and time than they would have in mileage, and that was just over a couple of months, this wasn't going to be getting smaller over the years. My boss and operations guy had a chat, and I was able to use my own vehicle once again, though encouraged to use a work vehicle anytime I was going north, which made sense, and people who might have otherwise wanted it would have to adjust their own lives to deal with my use of the vehicle. Do you know who I am? So a few years ago, I used to work for a tech company with a fruit logo as a technician. Part of the job was making appointments and checking people into the Genius Bar. I routinely got put on check in which I didn't mind because I was fairly good at de-escalating the angry people who come in for appointments to get their devices fixed and told we have long wait times, the store was only slow when we closed. It was more common for walk-in wait times to be 2 plus hours, but if people were nice or genuine I knew some ways to make the appointment time significantly less. After a while I got talked to my leadership to try to avoid doing that and to move through the line because it affected the amount of in-store wait times and made us look bad which is fine I understood that. However anytime an angry customer came in and threw a hissy fit, super rich area, and the never being told no mentality was common, the management folded over and did whatever they asked. A few days later I'm back on check-in and the line is to the door and packed we have two people on check-in and moving quickly but not quick enough. I see a larger dude in a nice suit that walked into the store and right past the obvious line straight to me and starts yelling he has to be seen right now. He tells me he has an issue with his phone that sounds like a simple software bug that we can fix easily and I tell him. I'm sorry you're having these issues but rest assured we can and we'll get them fixed for you. Unfortunately though our wait times are extremely long, but if you return to the line and wait I can either put you in our queue and text you when we're ready, or I can make an appointment for later on today or tomorrow. At this point I notice his face turning red, and he looks like he's about to blow. The dude screams at me do you know who I am? Do you know what I do? I am important and I need this phone working now. So find someone to help me. At this point in the day I was already tired and was about 30 minutes late for lunch because the line was so long and I stayed to help my replacement with the line a bit. I stopped what I was doing and dropped my customer service smile and looked at the dude with the dead-eyed worn-out retail worker stare and said. Sir I have no idea who you are, but if you need help with that you're in the wrong place the hospital is about two exits down I suggest you go there. But if you need help with your phone and want to be seen right now I will do so. If you tell every person you walked past that your time is more valuable than theirs so you must go first. If they agree I'll get you taken care of, but if not get to the end of the line and wait like everyone else. Surprisingly the dude actually turned to the lady I was helping when he barged in and started to say ma'am I have. Before she just cut him off and said no I told him you heard her sorry please move to the end of the line. I never found out who he was because he stomped like a child and stormed out of the store throwing the heavy doors open and disappearing from view. After he left I helped the lady and went to lunch. When I got back my leadership on the floor told me I should have tried to be more helpful, 
and I told him, I just got talked to for being too helpful and for the rest of the time I worked there they didn't bring up the issue again. I believe the guy probably sent his secretary or assistant up because that practice in this store was really common. The do you know who I am? Phrase became an inside joke between me and some co-workers when we had demanding customers. If you made it to the end of the video, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share, and we will see you in the next video.